last uh, six or seven years with the Academy. And as I travel and as I read, I try to always keep an open eye for, for potential speakers for the Academy. Uh, last spring I was in London and had the pleasure of uh, listening to our next speaker. And um, with uh, a little bit of uh, persuasion, we were able to get her to come all the way from Paris. Um, Dr. Kuby is, a, is the president of the Association for the Development of Stoma, uh, Stomata, uh, Stomatotherapy in France basically following in the tradition of her father who was a real pioneer as she is in the area. He was a uh, um, collaborator with Dr. Ernesto Adler and some of the really early pioneers in stomatotherapy. Um, she's not only, uh, she has a wonderful perspective I think and a real common sense approach to the area of oral toxicology by being not only a practicing dentist uh, but as well an oral surgeon and a medical physician. Uh, and her first book will be published next year. Uh, without taking any more time from her, I want to give a warm Academy welcome to Dr. Agnes Kuby. I don't know if you are going to thank the Aurora Academy to have invited me here because my English is far from perfect and uh, it's going to be a little frustrating for me to share my ideas with you in English and not in French and I hope it will not be too much boring for you. So I am going to, l to read my papers. As you know, the phenomenon of dental toxicity, even if based on scientific evidences, it's usually ignored, and what's worse, it's sometimes even totally denied. And concerning this, I am going to start my lectures with one of my favorite cases. You are going to, to understand why it's my favorite cases. It's the case of a lady, she was 76 years old when she consulted me after numerous aggravating disorders. For six years, she has developed leg arthritis, which had led to a sympathectomy without any results. She had a bypass on the heart and the splenectomy. She had also cholecystectomy, cancer of the colon with left colostomy. She was suffering from left shoulder arthritis and from chronic bronchitis. In six years, nobody had ever asked her to open her mouth to check her teeth. In fact, the condition was catastrophic. You can pass the first panoramic, please. Yes. As, as you can see, there are many periapical foci here, over there, and uh, here. Periodontal lesions with deep pockets and tartar, cavities under gum, impacted wisdom teeth with cysts. And the day of my first consultation in November, she was suffering in her right shoulder, saying she could not raise her arm normally. A simple opening test on this teeth, I will let you know more about this test later. But a simple opening test on this teeth, and she felt some relief instantly in her shoulder. And I hoped this small success could have enabled her to understand the relationship between her mouth and her other disorders. She maybe could now understand how important it was to eradicate all foci located in her mouth. However, she refused to have teeth extracted or retreated, saying she did not feel, she did not feel convinced that this was so necessary. 
and I let you observe that she had never questioned the numerous surgical interventions in other parts of the body during the, pre the preceding years. But I have forgotten to tell you something about her. And you are now understand why she is, this case is one of my favorites. Well, in fact, this lady was my mother-in-law for a few months. And I let you imagine how easy was my position in that story. However, after a while, under the pressure of the family, she accepted to come back for a lighter program. On that same day, in March, just before coming to my surgery, she was taken to a hospital in intensive care. She started a pneumococcus meningitis. Then she acquired septicemia, severe pneumopathy, kidney deficiency with dialysis, cerebral lesions. She was fighting for her life for two months in intensive care. And there, the chief of staff, aware of her malfunctive condition, which I talked to him about, recognized that it could be a portal of entry in her teeth for her meningitis. However, the patient's condition made it impossible to have any intervention in her mouth. And fortunately, after two months, in May, it was in 93, uh, the patient came out of the coma. But her general condition remained worrying. No consciousness or reasoning, aphasia, incontinence. To summarize, she was still alive, but she had become a cabbage. No improvement from May to September. That's why in September she was placed in a center for severely handicapped people. But in May she was sent to consult the chief of staff in a, a, a very known chief of staff in Paris in oral surgery. He decided, although I call him to explain her case before the consultation, that there was nothing urgent to do with that. He said all roots were in good shape. He noticed they could be retreated, then the patient would be healthy enough to receive endodontic treatments. This strange diagnosis, diagnosis was, as you can see, in contradiction with the panoramic X-ray. But with, on this panoramic X-ray, you, 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 clearly, you clearly see that even the bone was infected around the teeth and had been so for many years. We insisted to get a consultation in another hospital. There, in September, finally, nine teeth were extracted under general anesthetic, allowing spectacular recovery the following days with Dramatically improved hearing, recognizing and understanding, ability to get up and walk, normal continence. Three weeks later, in the beginning of October, she came home. The exit statement of the handicapped center described all improvements in detail, but nowhere did he mention the link between her recovery and the intervention in her mouth. They pointed out the efficacy of her education care. To conclude this story, I want to insist on the most interesting points in that story. This very specific example is presenting or is gathering together all the various cases of denial we are frequently faced with. First, the doctor, head of intensive care, although searching for an infectious portal of entry, doesn't take into consideration the dental priority. Secondly, the first oral surgeon, also one of the most well-known in Paris, in hospital, refuses to consider the importance of extractions for unclear reasons or lack of knowledge. The administration itself doesn't mention at all the intervention in the patient's mouth. And in the beginning, the patient doesn't want to admit the relationship between a general state of health and her dental status, and I must add that even after recovery and have been without any pain in her children, 
in her shoulder, and without any bronchitis ever since, she declares to be scared to have to wear dentures. In French, the translation have to have a grudge against somebody is to have a tooth against somebody. So you can easily understand why my mother-in-law always has a tooth against me. This example to say how exciting it can be to practice oral medicine, but, how, but also how difficult it is sometimes to be recognized. Well, I am going to tell you a little bit more uh, about my background and what had led me here. To do that, I'm going to go far back in time. My father, Dr. Davo Kubi, who is now 77, 76, no, 77 years old, was a dentist. From the beginning of his practice, he was interested in the existing relationship between dental problems and general state of health. It's true that in the 50s and the 60s, focal infection was more recognized than it is today. Much work and research were even done in hospitals and universities on the subject. I can, I can quote some names you certainly know, like Hunter, Price, Billings, Rosno in the States, and Adler, Uneke, the father of the neural therapy in Germany, and in France, Le Poivre, De Chaume, Raison, and in, in Suède, Sturtebaker, I don't know if you know him, but I wish I had been lucky enough to meet him, but he recently died, and his numerous books about focal disease, disease and mercury disorder uh, give us very precise anatomical and physiological knowledge. It describes in detail the different venous connection between teeth and brain that, that can explain how and why you can have disorder in brain because of the dental status. All the publications of all of these remarkable scientists have been denied or ignored and then forgotten. We could find reasons to explain why they have been forgotten, but that's not what we are here to discuss today. However, I would like to say that among these reasons, there is one which seems to me to be the most interesting and the most important, is the over-specialization of orthodox medicine. The absence of the concept of treating the all and the lack of consciousness of the interdependence of the organ and biological functions. And it's the a physician came here just before me and he talked about communication and I think in our, our present medicine, the, print, the main problem is a problem of communication. We have a good medicine, we have a good technical medicine, but we don't communica communicate with each other. Each specialty stay with, uh, with itself. The ophthalm oph ophthalmologist, cardiologist, uh, dentist, and they don't speak to each other. They have a lot to, to tell each other, to say each other. Um, now back to my story. <laughs> for, more, for, more than, for more than 30 years, my father refined his diagnosis. He perfected certain simple clinical tests. This easy test, similar to neural therapy, allows us an instant diagnosis of the link between a dental irritation and a distant affected area. That means between an oral perturbation and another symptom in an entirely different part of the body. I will let you know more about this test later. It were two books, and Ernesto Adler, as you, you said, was, was a friend of and correspondent of my father's, and uh, Ernesto Adler uh, did several books on focal irritation and neural therapy. And I, I was therefore raised in this atmosphere, and I chose to study medicine, to learn physiology, to better understand physiopathological mechanisms, and to be able to practice medic, um, dental medicine without worrying about being accused, as my father and others, of unlawful medicine. 
a dentist can be accused of unlawful medicine. That seems crazy. Uh, does a dermatologist or a cardiologist can be accused too? No, but that's sure. I've forgotten. Teeth are not part of the body. Everybody knows that. Then I specialized in, st in stomatology. The exact meaning of this French specialty is diseases and minor surgery of the mouth and teeth. Of course, it would not be surprising to tell you that during all those years, I was never trained by my different chief of staff in global medicine and even less in dental medicine. During my studies, I noticed that most of the time the patient's dental condition wasn't taken into consideration even before undergoing such long treatments as chemotherapy or corticotherapy. I also noticed that for the beds I was in charge with during my studies, when I asked for extensive removal of damaged teeth, patients presented less complications during those long treatments, like corticotherapy or chemotherapy, and what's more, we obtained better results. In 84, I presented my thesis on distant manifestations caused by oral irritations, I mean the same symptoms in other parts of the body than the mouth. I also included a special part on tendinitis originating from a dental problem, and during this time, incurring foci, I systematically obtained excellent results among athletes suffering from tendinitis. It was probably beginner's luck. But it has encouraged me to continue in the same way. In 85, I started my practice in Paris, and from the beginning, my practice has always consisted in diagnosing the relationship that can exist between general symptoms, a disease, and certain disruptive phenomena present in the patient's mouth. The goal is to establish a medical dental course of treatment according to the general symptoms and the patient's general state of health. Right from the, the start of my practice, I was more particularly interested in pathology linked to two causes. The first one, irritated living teeth. In fact, dentine, which even seems to be only mildly irritated, can in certain cases provoke symptoms in other parts of the body. An irritation of this type can induce a neuronic disturbances, often neurovegetative, and can reach pa over parts of the body. The, the first uh, slide, please. It's a slide to remind ba basic physiology of the trigeminal nerve. Oh, it's very simple. Even without infection, a simple irritation in the area of the trigeminal nerve can lead to, lead to, dev to general symptom, because if it's, uh, if it's multiple neurological connections, central and peripheral, it is the trigeminal nerve is the most reflex nerve of the body. And I recall that each time the trigeminal endings are irritated in the dental pulp, in the bone, in the dense desmodental tissues, in the gingival tissues, with foci uh, or cavitation or irritating living tooth, the, there can be at the same time a neurovegetative attack. And that's very important. And to illustrate that, I remember a bodybuilder, a former Mr. Universe, who was extremely muscular, but however, one of his legs had recently been giving way beneath him. It seemed incredible considering the size and the strength of the muscles, but in fact, he had just had a vital canine prepared for a bridge. The preparation had been done under local anesthetic and probably too quickly. But although the tooth was still alive, the pulp had been irritated because of the heat of the drill. To cure the leg's weakness of this patient, we have had to stop the trigeminal irritation. Unfortunately, in this case, the only option has been a root canal treatment. This example demonstrates that even still alive, a tooth can also become a focus. 
We make a mistake when we speak about focal infection. We have to broaden the concept. It would be more appropriate to speak about focal irritation. And besides this, this type of irritation, at that time, I was especially interesting, interested in focal infection with lesions, with, with, um, with uh, lesions such as dead teeth, cavitations, gum infections, impacted teeth, and also root canal past entering the soft tissues, the maxilla, or sinus, as a result of an overfilling. Besides the clinical approach, I was following with specific biologic te biological tests the immune system reactions of patients suffering from various symptoms before and after curing foci. And I observed a lot of clinical and biological improvements in treating this disturbing phenomena. And then I was fortunate to meet and work with masters who enabled me to further my knowledge. First, first of all, I studied with Dr. Baron, which is a French neuro-ophthalmologist who has dedicated his life to studying posture, which he called orthostatic tonic postural activity, OTPA. In short, it's the study of the mechanisms which enable us to remain standing involuntarily. The second slide, please. Briefly, many sensory motor mechanisms control and regulate the OTPA, the posture activity. The mandication system with its proprioceptors is one of the various and specific systems that belong to general body scheme structure, as you see on, on this slide. Uh, in 1945, already Baron, Le Poivre, the French team, Munier and Raison, in numerous scientists' publications attract scientists' attention of the physiological and anatomical relation that exists between the third, fourth, sixth nerve of eye motor muscles, the eighth, eleventh cranial nerves, and of course the fifth, I mean the trigeminal nerve. They also describe numerous clinical cases. Many studies have been conducted in different countries about postural disorders related to TMG and occlusion problems. But at that time, because of my clinical experience, I thought that occlusion problems were not as frequent as it was thought to be the primary cause of postural dysfunction. I thought that in the analysis, most of practitioners forgot to include the diagnosis of the foci as a differential diagnosis. And my work in Dr. Barron's laboratory has consisted of proving again that dental irritation by their own, not including occlusion and balance, also can provoke postural disorders. I have done a presentation of my study during the International Congress in Posture in Newport in 1990. Similar studies have be, had been already done by the French university team that I mentioned before, apparently almost totally ignored. And uh, later on, I heard a lot about the theories of chiropractors. You certainly know Dr. Goodhart in the US and his di disciple, Dr. Melsman. He is established now in Italy. They collaborated together on the creation of the specific test, the compressed test, you certainly know. In short, when a postural problem is present, this test enables us to know whether or not the primary lesion is an inclusion dysfunction. Briefly, the test consists, first of all, of a clinical analysis of the posture. We evaluate certain precise musculoarticular symptoms. Then, we ask to the patient to bite into a thin soft plate the patient has to walk and to swallow at the same time, and we repeat exactly the same posture evaluation that before biting. The difference in posture before and after biting the plate enables us to know if the posture problems stem from the occlusion. And once again, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work in Jean-Pierre Mersman Clinic in Combe in Italy. And at this time, he was particularly concerned with TMG dysfunction resulting from emotional stress. Consequently, my knowledge of posture occlusion and emotional stress broadened and I started becoming interested in kinesiology. Then following this experience and during several years, my work in France with other doctors, dentists and osteopaths was based on continually repeated clinical experiments. This 
allowed us to better approach the complex mechanisms of oral medicine. And first, with TMG dysfunction, I, I want to stress that we systematically assume it to be an occlusion problem and we treat it at best using a bite plate or in the worst scena case scenario with selective grinding. But the cause can also be a distant osteopathic lesion, an emotional stress, and I insist on this very often, an, an irritative focus on the, the uh, desmodontal mandibular afferences or desmodontal maxillary afferences. And now I have spoken so far about various subjects and perhaps you're wondering about metals. I've been interested in them for several years and I practice high doses of vitamin C infusion and since I am AKM diplomate, I practice also chelation. And consequently, I was very impressed by the, um, all the speaker I saw this weekend and they gave me a lot of uh, new knowledge and uh, I appreciate. In my opinion, based on my day-to-day -day experience, I, wa I want to add something about metals. In my opinion, uh, problems linked to electrogalvanism are at least as frequent as those linked to metal toxicity. And I am also very preoccupied in France with something you certainly encounter too. In fact, I've seen and I often see patients who have had their amalgams removed just because of some article they have read in a popular magazine on mercury toxicity. And they are often removed without regard to any de detoxification protocol or operating protocol. And if metabolic problems with heavy metals are really present in these patients, this is likely to trigger off some pathology. And furthermore, what's, what have these mercury fillings replaced with? In most cases, they've been replaced more or less correctly by composites without any testing for biocompatibility or possible toxicity. And what's more, composite re resins placed into deeply affected premolar or molars can result in the devitalization of these teeth Thus, in few years, possible mercury toxicity is replaced by the eventual toxicity of a dead tooth. I let, think, I let you think about that. I've considered the different disturbances from all over angles that we can encounter in the mouth. But now, what to do about them? Have all devitalized teeth to be extracted? All metals to be eliminated? and hold patients to receive systematic chelation? When we examine a patient suffering from general symptoms or a disease and having all these risk factors in his mouth, foci, metal, electrogalvanism, occlusion disorders, what we do begin with? To answer this, we have to go or to return to the basic rules of the general state of health. For everyone, the general state of health results from a subtle interaction between regulation mechanisms, the defense system, the improvement mechanisms, and also lifestyle and responsiveness to treatments. These are the predisposition factors or risk factors. Firstly, the innate factors. We are all born with a different genetic makeup. For example, we may inherit a fragile immune system such as being HLA-B27 positive. This is a genetic predisposition factor to develop rheumatoid arthritis. But only 40% of people who are HLA-B27 positive will develop the disease. Later on, a quiet factor will intervene. This can link to lifestyle, stress, infection, socio-professional condition, iatrogenic factors, and other factors we don't know yet. In fact, a human being all throughout his life will be subjected to diverse aggressions. Chemicals such as infection, food poisoning, environmental pollution, medications, physical such as a car accident with wave flash, emotional stress like mourning or divorce, 
And it's the synergy of numerous innate and acquired factors that will determine the onset of the pathology. The intensity of the innate predisposition factor is more or less high at birth. Some are born with few burdensome factors. Then a long time and especially numerous acquired risk factors will be necessary to, to trigger off a disease. Others are born with a heavy burden such as diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroiditis, cardiovascular pathology, cancer, etc., which run in the family. For these, with innate predisposition factors which are already serious, the threshold of tolerance to a quiet factor will be lower and very little will be needed to trigger off a pathology. And we can easily see how the oral sphere also plays a role in the mechanism of several contributory factors. Oral sphere perturbation as predisposition factors. Innate factors, for example, poisoning of the fetus from, from uh, mercury or toxin from the mother's teeth during in utero. A quiet factor, infectious or chemical, irritative foci, cavitation impact, the teeth devitalized teeth, etc. Physical factor, occlusion problem, postural imbalance, and yeah, trogenic factor. As IOMT's practitioner, I am not going to teach you that most products used in dentistry can be toxic. The level of one state of health will depend on the synergy of all these risk factors. In fact, each person showing risk factors doesn't necessarily trigger off a pathology. In particular, concerning our specialty, it would be absurd to say that all foci, all metal toxicity will absolutely lead to serious disturbances. It will depend at any given moment for everyone of the convergence of the several disruptive excitations and also of the prior, prior state of the patient who is confronted with these excitations. This prior state is de determined by the combined action of the previous innate and acquired risk factors. I am going to give you some example, panoramic, uh, the second one. I told you before that rheumatoid arthritis is not necessarily going to, to, um, to be developed when the patient will has a genetic predisposition to develop it. S yet others will, will develop it. And this example is uh, it's a young lady and her grandfather already was suffering from a severe rheumatoid arthritis. She started to show signs of fatigue after each vaccination. And after a bereavement in, his fa in her family at age 16, she started having articular pains. She was diagnosed HLA-B27 positive as her grandfather and medical treatment stabilized her. Then at age 22, her medical uh, shoulders started giving her serious problems. At that time, extracting, I did not know her at that time, but extracting her wisdom teeth, and we, ca we can see that there, is there are accreditation instead of the wisdom teeth now. Uh, she complained, she mm, cured her, her shoulder pains. But a few years later, fatigue came back, and she complained again about her shoulder, saying she could not even walk and she developed a severe inflammatory syndrome. Luckily for her, her doctor thought immediately of her teeth. It was at this time that I saw her for the first time. And I felt that the pressure on the return canine, lower right mild canine, you see here, caused by the growth of the permanent canine, had led to a silent inflammation and the shoulder pain instantly stopped with the extraction of the deciduous canin and biological inflammation syndrome lowered and she worked again. Third, pan uh, third panoramic. It's another case, less severe. It's a young athlete and she tears some ligament in her knee while making a strong muscular effo effort. The cause of the tear is a straining of her muscle. 
But yet, six months later, the knee pain persists in spite of medical treatment. And as you can see, a deciduous molar had been obstructing the eruption of the permanent molar. A specific test, it's like neural therapy, relies on it here, immediately improved the knee pain and the extraction of the, the, of the, the tooth, the, not the permanent, but the deciduous tooth, cured the knee problem. But, and with these two examples, we can observe various interesting points. In dental focus, is, and in the first case, able to directly trigger off a distant septum as a shoulder for, for the first case. And in the second case, it can also act on a weak point of the organism, in this case, the torn ligament, just as a modulator. And we can see in, this in the first case how such tiny dental defects can, for certain people, overload or favorize such, such severe pathology as rheumatoid arthritis. And we know that for others, it will only lead to tendinitis, tendinitis, excuse me. And yet, for others, even bigger lesions will have absolutely no effect. And we can make a rapid comparison with the pathology linked to metal. If a patient's weak point is a dysfunction of heavy metal metabolism, then he will be able to develop toxicity symptoms because of the metal placed into his mouth. Others with silver fillings, for example, we tolerate them because they can more easily support mercury. So all this explains why we cannot use the same approach for, for everyone. Medical dental procedures will be different for a patient in good health without any particular symptomatology, for a patient with easy reversible functional signs, and for patients suffering from a serious disease. And being going, uh, before going further, I'd like to be more specific about a few things. From the beginning, 40 years ago, I've only seen patients in my practice for general symptoms. They never come to, to me initially for primary dental care. The recruitment of my patients is not the same as a dentist who see patients with it being initially preoccupied with their general, without being initially preoccupied with their general symptoms. Therefore, my experience is more in the medical field than only in the technical dental field. But as you certainly know, if we question our patients, most of the time, we'll find they're at least suffering from rheumatic pain, digestive symptoms, fatigue, allergy, repetitive infection, repetitive infection. And I stress again the fact a dentist should, above all, be a doctor. Dentistry should be considered as its own specialty, just all the other specialties in medicine, cardiology, dermatology, rheumatology. At the present time, dentists are becoming technicians who are more and more specialized and more and more sophisticated. However, they too often forget that the teeth they work on are in a human body and not in a piece of wood. The Thank you. Um, the s slide, please. Uh, no, uh, next one, next one. No, 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 it's, a it's, uh, no, I think it's a slide 10. This is a chart, this is my chart. <laughs> and this chart summarizes my, my personal approach to dental medicine based on my day-to-day -day experience. It represents for every patient doctors and doctors and dentist procedures according to these following three categories of health status level. Uh, HSL is health status level. Health status level one, 
patient in good general health, uh, in good general health without any symptomatology. In level two, chronic patient with chronic functional symptoms like rheumatoid uh, pains, rheumatoid pains, fatigue, chronic allergy, and. In the third one is patients with organic symptoms, generative disease, cardiovascular, immune, neurological, cancer. For sure, some patients can be between two levels. This categorization is over simple, but it enables us to analyze cases a little, bo a little more clearly. Uh, first of all, the general ideas. For the doctors, the panoramic X-ray should be part of the general checkup, just like the chest X-ray or the electrocardiogram. With panoramic, dentists and doctors can very rapidly evaluate all possible risk factors present in the patient's mouth: foci, mixing metal, oral galvanism, occlusion and balance, and abnormal TMG amalgams. And uh, for a preventative point of view, economically speaking, the panoramic X-ray would certainly reduce health costs much more than the ECG and the chest X-ray. The panoramic X-ray is a medical ID. The, the doctor cannot medically consider two patients with the same general symptoms in the same way, one without any feeling or dead teeth, and the other one with a mouth full of foci. And for the, the doctor, collaboration with the dentist is essential. If peop people have on their hands what they have on their in their mouth, they, they would be certainly sick because of their hands as they are because of their teeth. And it's very important for doctors to know, to know everything about that. For the dentist, was once again, we are uh, never without a panoramic. And we, I often hear that a panoramic is not, so not, preci not preci pre precise excuse me, enough. But before looking at a specific point we have with a per periapical x-ray, it's necessary to have general view. Otherwise, once again, we make the mistake of over-specialization, over which is so dangerous. And instead of rushing at his mouth, take your time. First, question your patients about his general symptoms, and you rapidly know if you place him in level one, in level two, or in level three. And you are not going to have the same medical dental approach if he is in level one, or if he is in level two, or if he is in level three. And your course of treatment will be different for a level one, a level two, or a level three. That's oral medicine. Um, and uh, for dentists too, it's really necessary to collaborate with doctor. And um, procedure. And now the procedure according to every different health status level. Level one. The doctor's role is to conserve the health status. This is a preventative medicine adapted to different contributory factors, like uh, he has to, t the doctor has an, to have an informative role, he has to, to, to teach how to practice healthy li living, nutrition, exercises, to, f to fight bad habits. But he, has also, he is also the first one who can make the patient, and especially the parents, if appropriate, aware of the importance of dental history. And for the dentist in level one, the dentist's role is to propose the high quality preventative dentistry that for sure ever you are practicing. The dentist must teach good oral hygiene, raise conscious awareness of dental risk factors, fighting sugar habits, giving advice in nutrition, preventing cavities and orthodontic troubles. And we can hope that little by little, we will not longer see that we see today in patients' mouth. At in level two, patients have chronic functional signs, and most consultations in doctor's surgery or doctor's office concern functional symptoms, such as rheumatic pain, allergy, chronic infection, thyroid functional perturbation, nervous disorder. And for the doctors, when symptoms are present, the doctor needs to use symptomatic treatments, but he also has to charge for the cause. There, he has not to forget the dental concept, and especially when he has no answer for the cause. <coughs> and as in level one, he's still practicing a preventative medicine to avoid the patient entering in level three. 
the for the dentist <coughs> the dentist must always practice preventative dentistry as in level one but additionally he must play the role of a private detective in collaboration with the doctor they can work together to find the relationship between any chronic symptom and the dental state. And I have called this activity the stomatotherapy. It was the, the slide. Stomatotherapy, what, what is it? Um, stomatotherapy's goal is to, d is to determine the exact course of treatment which is going to cure or significantly improve dental distant general symptoms. I mean symptoms apparently far from the mouth but yet directly related to. And first, a sick patient, firstly, we must consider all varying medical and dental clinical signs which will allow us to clearly focus on the guilty element or elements, meaning foci or material, bite dysfunctions or electrogalvanism or even simple trigeminal irritation. Then the stomatotherapy, combining also analysis of the panoramic X-ray and certain specific tests, permit us to choose specifically adapted dental treatments in order to participate in curing the patient. And what are those tests? Next slide. I categorize them in two sorts. First of all, Diagnostic test. <coughs> Diagnostic test. Just before. You know them, and I mixed alternative test and orthodox test. I am not uh, going to emphasize this test, but um <coughs> But you, you certainly practice this test and you know that they help us to, defin to define the, the adapted course of treatment. But I want to stress one of the, the best and the most simple testing for foci, it's touching. When you find an area, even, even if, um, when you find an area which is hurting the patient, it's something happened and with your finger. And often the patient says, oh, it's hurting me for a long time. And I told it to my dentist. It, it, it took, to, it took her, uh, an x-ray and he said that no, there is nothing serious, but it still hurts. And if it, it's hurting, that's it's something is wrong. It's impossible that uh, nothing happens. You have to, to, to deal with that. You have to, to, to touch and to every, every uh, when you have sick patients, you have, you it's, a, it's a good test. test. Um, all, all, the, the all of our tests, you know, and I am not going to, to describe that. But beside this diagnostic test, we can also use diagnostic and therapeutic tests, the others. First of all, the neural therapy. And uh, this diagnostic and therapeutic tests are a little bit different from the, the first one. They are just diagnostic tests because this di diagnostic and therapeutic test, I, I'm, I call that DT test. They allow us not only to diagnose, but also at the same time to improve the patient. And the common point of all these following DT test is that their application to the focus area in the mouth leads to an instant relief of the distant on the distant septum. That's why we have to use them when during your consultation a patient is suffering from a functional symptom like, for example, a rheumatic pain. Um, and uh, neural therapy is very interesting. And I think you know the basic rules. Every chronic affection can be under control of one disturbable field, DF. Every part of the body can become the site of one disturbable field, and the injection of procaine around the disturbable field intens instantly stops distant phenomena when they are related. This is a basic rule um, from the, the man uh, Yuneke I, I said before. Next, next one. 
You have, you have a lot of uh, different tests like that. It's a neural therapy cold testing. It's when you, 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 can, um, you can apply cold on the, on the maxilla, on the gum, and see if instantly you have a relief in uh, a distant symptom. With laser, you can do that. With uh, acupuncture needle, you can do that. And these are, these are the, the tests of my father. I'm going just to describe the first one. Uh, it's an opening test. I explain. A crown on a devitalized tooth can be like a damaged tin can with gas in it. Sometimes on opening, it smells terrible. You know that. And um, on opening the dentine, even a little, this can perhaps lower the pressure in the tooth, tooth and also around the tooth in the periodontal ligament in the bone or on the proprioceptor. Or maybe is this opening changing fluids into dentine and around in the bone. I don't know how it works, but it works. And it's not because we cannot explain a fact that it doesn't exist. And anyway, whatever the exact mechanism, the little opening test often leads to instant spectacular improvement of distant symptom. And um, I want to add that without the help given by all these tests, DT tests, as proof of the reality of the link, it would be difficult to persuade the patient to retreat or extract some responsible teeth or to cure some cavitations. And these DT tests allow us and the patient to be more confident in the hope for results of the proposed dental treatment. And when a patient arrives in your surgery with violent lumbar, neck, or knee pain, and when he is instantly relieved by a brief test in his mouth, he is convinced of the link between his mouth and her dis his distant symptom, except my mother-in-law. So this makes everything easier for the patient and for the practitioner. And the combined action of these two sorts of tests, D-test and DT-test, is very useful to establish the necessary dental treatment to improve the patient's general symptoms. Back to the chart, please. <laughs> but don't forget something essential. We have to allow the well-informed patient to choose, and it can happen that even with a positive test, for example, improvement of a painful chronic inflammation of the knee with a test relies on one tooth, the patient prefers a cortisone injection to re uh, retreating or extracting the tooth. It's his or her choice. He or she has been informed of the relationship. And at stage two, in using stomatotherapy, we have to try to find the essential causes, then treat them. We don't have to extract all dead teeth. We don't have to systematically remove all silver fillings. In level two, the general pathology is reversible. So it's still possible to try our hardest to save the tooth with root canal retreatments. And first with general symptoms, before any decisions, we must start with an investigation protocol, the strategy in order to determine the necessary dental treatment to improve these general symptoms. Panoramics, panoramic four, please. This is um, a man, he was 60 69 years old, and uh, she was suffering from uh, uh, she was suffering I don't know yes uh, he was suffering from a tendinitis tendinitis spread to left foot right tendinitis spread to left foot later he cannot play tennis anymore he even develops definite difficulties walking several medical and physiotherapy treatments without results and he's consulting under the pressure of his wife. And he doesn't want or think to have anything to do in his mouth. And I, I, I want to add something. His best friend is his dentist. As you can see, he has many potential risk factors. He has potential foci. Uh, he has also possible, he has metals and uh, he has uh, possible occlusion dysfunction and possible electrogalvanism 
And this patient is, except for this tendonitis, in good shape. That's why we cannot place him at the bottom. We can place him at the bottom of health status level two. It's only the application of the somatotherapy that allows us to find the right answer. We cannot uh, tell him that he has all the metal removed and uh, maybe one or two teeth extracted and uh, that he has to to replace uh, his teeth. It doesn't anyway. He doesn't want to do that. Uh, but with a specific opening test on this tooth, he immediately experiences greater flexibility his is in his ankle. That persuades him, again, his dentist and also friend's advice, to have at least this, this tooth retreated. Once the tooth is opened, he feels better, but as soon as it's refilled, the ankle pain comes back. And finally, it chooses the extraction that definitively cures the tendinitis. tendinitis. Another case, panor la next panoramic. It's, um, another, it's uh, another case is also in level two, but more severe. For two years, he was suffering from uh, nervous disorders that have led him to stop work anxiety with huge panic attacks, particularly in crowded streets and department stores, neuromuscular hyperactivity, fragile throat, stomach cramps, nausea, mm -hmm. diarrhea, back pain for many years. Again here, without any stomatotherapy therapy, therapy testing, most of practitioners could have thought about metals. They would have been wrong in this case. And what's more, causing a lot of useless expense for this patient without work. In fact, the metals were not guilty. The wisdom teeth were the cause of all these neurovegetative neuro disorders. A procaine injection around them instantly produced dramatic relief. And on leaving my office, the patient was able to go and stay a depart in a department store and the wisdom teeth extractions entirely cured him. For sure, after this dental treatment, these two patients were now back to health level status level one. So I have had to make them aware of their other dental risk factors, silent for the moment. So they have been capable, capable to decide to treat their teeth to prevent future health disorders or not. The first one did nothing more and the second, after having worked again, has chosen to remove his metals or uh, his silver fillings. Uh, come back to the chart, please. Uh, no, it's, it's another st uh, first chart. In level three of disease, serious degenerative disease is present. For the doctor, it's no longer a question of preserving the state of health, but it's a question of finding it once again. It's a matter of curative medicine, often extensive and in collaboration with the dentist when necessary. And for the dentist, the priority is no longer the teeth, but the body. It's not saving the teeth that counts, but the life of the patient. Improving overall health often includes dental extractions. Eradication of foci and detoxification of heavy metals must be done with all required medical precautions. And when the defense system of the, the organism is very weak, an extraction or an untimely removal of amalgam is a real shock. The patients need to be prepared to prevent the risk of worsening the situation. And um, panoramic, the six. Uh, it's a woman, she was 65, and she was suffering from very severe respiratory problems. And she um, was suffering from chronic allergy, running nose, asthma, bronchitis, uh, chronic cough for 20 years, several stays in hospital for first lung and then heart complications, including high blood pressure, 
all leading to one recent cardiac arrest. We are in level three. In summary, allergic problems leading to lung and heart inadequacy. The patient, uh, the patient also mentions an hypothyroid conditions since one year. She has she she is allergic to numerous metals, belt buckles, eyeglass frames, and when questioned, she informs me that the first symptoms coincide with placement of first crown, 20 years ago. Symptoms then worsen following an influenza vaccination sever several months later. And a few months ago, she had metal in her mouth, in her mouth, if, uh, excuse me, in her mouth removed, and uh, she felt much better without Crohn and with root canal teeth opened. Stronger symptoms return when new Crohn's are placed in her mouth, particularly, she told me, on this tooth and on this one. She asked to have them removed again, and she describes a relief of tight throat instantaneously when she has the Crohn on, on this tooth removed, once more as well as in um, as more no as well as an easier breathing when this were removed and she comes to my office subsequently she just left the o the hospital after the last cardiac event and that was the panoramic when i saw her for the first time she was very fragile with coughing and breathing with difficulty Instant breathing improvement simply through a little opening of these two teeth. Proof that patients' extremely poor health condition is not only due to metal toxicity. In this case, the toxicity is de of dead teeth is as important. And the very same, very same day, having extracted these two teeth, a huge health improvement appears very quickly. Then, together, we decide to extract all her devitalized teeth. She keeps feeling better and better. One month later, she also stops all thyroid medication, as her thyroid functions perfectly again, and she still has a complaint about her right thumb. This tooth was still alive, but deeply affected, and therefore the pulp was irritated. And when I simply start to remove the temporary cement, instantaneously relieves the pain in her thumb. She relieves the pain in her thumb. With this case, you can see once more that on the same person, not only infection, toxins, metal, but also a simple irritation of the trigeminal nerve can produce or overload a distant symptomatology. Next panoramic, please. This is a young lady. She was 33 with her rheumatoid arthritis since uh, one year. Onset directly following child delivery. And she was diagnosed uh, HLA B27 positive. And in addition, ever since the first attack, she has been suffering from pain in her right TMG, resulting in limited mouth opening possibilities. She has been complaining of violent pain in both her right hand and left knee, and also from, uh, f uh, from fatigue. And she had, she had um, a severe inflammatory syndrome. Stomatotherapy testing diagnosed this with a little opening on this tooth, immediate relief in hand, knee, and TMG. As I mentioned in the first part of my speech, a TMG dysfunction can stem also stem from a dental focus. This tooth had to be extracted without training any retreatment at level three of, of health status as here with an autoimmune disease, the priority is the body, not the teeth. This extraction cured pains and uh, dramatically improved the fatigue and the inflammatory syndrome because it relieved the immune system. Um, I, I think I am not going to have time enough to, to describe the second chart, so I think I am going to, to stop with, with this case. Uh, but 
A point I would like particularly to insist on is that material toxicity as not to make you forget or ignore the reality of the focal infection or focal irritation. The focal disease, the focal disease, the focal irritation or focal ir infection is focal disease. In French, we have various expressions for that. Um, I don't know, I don't think you have the same in English. A tree can hide the forest or one train may hide another one. And even with the best materials, a toxic tooth remains a toxic tooth. Too many practitioners think, think that the detoxification of a mouth consists only of removing the metal, metals and choosing biocompatible materials. It doesn't. The vitalized teeth and the bone around, even if it's not radically, radically <laughs> excuse me, you understand, I think, apparent, can fill with poison. Uh, I often like to compare the tooth to a piece of glass. In fact, once a deep scratch is done on a piece of glass, it's over. Whatever you try, it's over. It's impossible to rub it out, just, just as tooth. Once heat or rub, we can retreat it, we can treat it, but we never ca can cure it anymore. What's more, we fill it with more or less toxic material, so that becomes a lesional site the organism has to manage with. This dental irritation point is adding to all the other body weak points or contributory factors, and symptoms can appear. And when comparing all different cases, we easily see that the bottom line is the idea of individual threshold. All root canal teeth do not have to be extracted. Materials can well trigger intoxication for certain predisposed people and not for other. By dysfunction do not necessarily lead to posture troubles. And for sure, it would be safer not to have any focus, non-bite dysfunction, non-metals, non-irritation of the trigeminal nerve. But anyway, oral perfection is impossible. It would consist of having all one's teeth in the right places without any pest or future treatment on them. And the only way to approach that is through education, information, motivation, and prevention starting from childhood. That, I think, is the most important part of our job. And to conclude, for present already sick patients, the pre prevention time is over. That's why, that's why for present sick patients, the aim is not to eliminate all potential disruptive phenomena, but rather to give priority to the most active ones. That is to say, for each patient, choose to eliminate the disruptive phenomena which tend, we <laughs> to choose the disruptive phenomena which tend to reduce at one time his own health tolerance threshold. And when we are confronted with degenerative diseases, getting rid of dental foci and toxic products should be systematically considered. Other therapies in progress would be galvanized. But in any case, the patient must be made aware of the dental risks and consider them carefully. Properly, properly warned, the patient will be able to make the best decision for himself. It's a practitioner's job to inform his, his patient. Do I have the right to smoke, to drink, or to eat junk food? Yes. I do, but I'm advised ahead of time of the possible consequences. And in the case of many toxic teeth on people in mediocre health condition, these possible consequences become very probable consequences. I hope our joint effort in the interest of all will allow the concept of dental medicine to spread. And thank you. Dr. Kuby also has told me that um, in late May, Dr. Vimy will be over there to give a presentation, and then the following weekend, uh, she has helped put together a conference in Caen, in the south of France, uh, where she will be speaking. Uh, she's also invited myself and Dr. Boyd Haley to speak. 
And at that time, uh, she'll be launching a French chapter of the IAOMT there. So. Thank you so much for that uh, beautiful presentation. Now it's time for lunch.